I'm Mike, and this is Mo. So um, I will be doing, uh, th this is technically the SIGAUTH deep dive. So I'll be covering um, a little bit of SIGAUTH stuff. I'm going to give you guys a highlight reel of what we've been working on over the past year or so, because I know it's been a while since we talked. And then uh, hand, I'll hand it off to Mo, who will uh, begin the deep dive into pod security. So let's get started. So um, SIGAuth, what do we do? What are we responsible for? Um, SIGAuth is primarily responsible for um, authentication authorization to the Kubernetes API and various other um, uh, security controls, um, such as uh, admission and uh, authorization policy like RBAC and, and extensions therein. So um, one of the admissions that we're going to be talking about today is uh, pod security admission. Um, so what have we been doing for the past year or so? There's actually been a lot going on. So um, maybe uh, actually probably over a year ago, we, be, we began discussing the deprecation of uh, pod security policy um, and uh, discussing what it would mean to be a successor um, of pod security policy. Uh, and we knew that pod security policy had a, a lot of users in open source. Um, like we debated whether uh, we could defer those users to um, look at out of tree um, strategies for, for doing the same thing like OPA. Uh, ultimately, uh, we kind of landed on pod security, uh, which we will discuss in great depth, but is going to be beta in the upcoming release of Kubernetes. Yes, we're targeting targeting beta in 123. Um, the certificates API, which had uh, was long overdue for GA, uh, finally uh, launched GA in 119. Um, I, I think it had been around in beta since like 16. So it's like maybe three years overdue for uh, going GA. Um, so, before the GA, some, some notable changes were uh, added, such as uh, a new signer name API, so that now the API could be divided between uh, multiple consumers. Um, after GA, uh, a duration hint was added, so now you can sign certificates, or you can request uh, certificates for specific durations. Um, the exec auth cube control plugin and uh, extension uh, also went GA in 1.22, I think. Um, which uh, it was either 121 or 122. I can't actually remember. Right now. Yeah. I think it's 122. I think it's um, right. And that paves the way for moving some of the final entry uh, authentication plugins for clouds out of tree. So that's kind of part of the whole cloud provider extraction um, effort. Uh, and we also have a proposal to extend uh, support for those plugins to. Um, uh, to request signing and uh, like mutual TLS protocols. Um, and the token request uh, API, um, bound service count token volume and um, uh, provisioning uh, for bound service count tokens to replace like the, the uh, legacy secret tokens all went GA. Um, the, and I think the final GA was in 123. Um, so that's, a, I think, a huge accomplishment. I think we had been working on that for a couple of years. And um, uh, it should benefit the entire ecosystem because um, those have uh, significantly better security properties than the legacy tokens. Um, there's some more work to do there. Um, and finally, the last highlight is uh, we have a um, SIG subproject in uh, uh, called this uh, secret CSI driver. Um, there are actually implementations of, um, so CSI is the container storage interface. There are implementations of the secret CSI driver uh, with backends for uh, AWS, Azure, GCP, and Vault. Um, and that uh, allows configuring volumes uh, that project um, secrets in external uh, um, uh, secret storage providers. So um, I think the cap for GAing that just uh, merged maybe this last week. Um, 
Yeah, so we've been super busy. Uh, and with that, I will hand it off to Mo. Cool. Uh, I'll make some quick comments on this stuff. So uh, on the token request stuff, uh, some of the stuff that's left is to stop generating the secrets that back service accounts and really backpedal that functionality completely out of the API server or the uh, controller manager. Uh, so there's caps open for that. You know, there's plenty of work there to be done if anyone wants to get involved. Um, you know, we're a very cautious bunch of folks. Uh, we don't want to break everyone's stuff. Like we understand that you know people run real stuff on Kubernetes now. So we're trying very hard not to break things, but we also need to move the ecosystem forward. So there is a, uh, a balance there. And uh, like Rita and Anish have been working on Secret CSI driver for quite some time. Um, so that is also a place one could get involved uh, to try to push things forward. So the rest of the talk is mostly a code walkthrough. So uh, Tabitha and Tim had a talk earlier today at 2.30 that talks about the new, P, uh, the new pod security stuff from the perspective of like an end user. This one is more focused as the perspective as a, like a perspective contributor, right? Like if you care about how the code is implemented and you know, maybe you want to get involved and help us get it from beta to GA and so forth. Uh, so everything in the code walkthrough is based on 123 alpha 3. So if you see something that's not what's in head of master right now, that's just, that's probably why. Um, but in particular, uh, Jordan and Tim really set an incredibly high bar for the code, which is unlike basically anything that exists within tree that, you know, this thing has to run, you know, be able to run standalone without like an API server, um, can be run as a webhook, maybe used in CI tooling. Um, also all the, the checks, like, you know, is this a pair, uh, is this a privileged pod or whatever, all of those are implemented as individual units. So there's not like some large spaghetti thing that checks all the things. Uh, and the idea there is over time, you know, we'll evolve these things and add new checks or iterate on the, an existing check, but at a different version. So all of that stuff led to a pretty, um, pretty elaborate implementation for what sort of just sounds like a pretty simple thing. Like, you know, if this field is set on a pod, say no, you're not allowed to do that because that's a privileged pod or whatever. Um, so as a, most of this slide is, just, or sorry, most of this talk is just me going through the code editor, but I did have two slides. So as an example, uh, this is from uh, one of Jordan's examples on this stuff. If you wanted uh, to run a little CLI that would, for example, do some linter checks on some pod specs that were going to be committed into your, like your prod clusters coming up, right? You're going to do some promotion but you wanted to validate that they met some security requirements, right? And you just want to gate this. All right, so it, this is basically the skeleton of a tool that can run just completely without an API server just and statically validate things, right? So uh, the pot security stuff, unlike PSP, is much more constrained, right? You basically say what level of the API you want and what version. Right, so like baseline or restricted. So restricted is best, right? If you if your pod can work under that, that's what you want. And you know maybe uh, maybe you're on like version 1.19 right now, and you're like, all right, I want to make sure that this stuff is going to run on 120. So I'm going to go ahead and try to validate against 120 and see like if I need to go talk to my developers and like figure out some stuff before we actually move stuff forward. So like you know we pass those things in. Uh, we'll go over like what the evaluator and the checks are like, but basically if you're if you're familiar with the Kubernetes code base You're probably f familiar with the builder pattern that we have uh, So all this is doing is like, you know passing in some files locally uh, And then it's just doing the visitor pattern on all those files And so the actual visitor is basically like all right. I was given something with a pod spec deployment, whatever uh, I'm gonna extract that spec out and then I'm just gonna evaluate it against the level and the version, whatever you passed me, and just check if it's allowed or not, right? So in roughly like 100 lines of code, you have like effectively like a production ready CI tool. Uh, and that's kind of the hope from this is that um, 
we want to enable people to build tooling off of this and you know, offer value just outside of just pure Kubernetes admission. So the, the notes um, that I have kind of, basically I went through the, the code and tried to write notes on like interesting aspects that might not be completely obvious. So all the notes are on that uh, fork of mine. Uh, so now I'm just gonna kind of walk through some stuff and uh, hopefully it'll be helpful for folks. Can you all read that okay? We tried to make the text nice and big early on. Uh, so if you're familiar with Kubernetes admission, all of the, all of the stuff gets wired up in this API server package. Uh, uh, so admission is uh, ordered in the sense that it's a deny-based system, right? So uh, with a deny-based system, the ordering of checks matters a lot because if you have an early check that denies, it guarantees that the rest of the stack was, wouldn't run. So one of the things that you know, pod security does is to make sure it runs before pod security policy because you can run pod security in an audit and warning mode, so it won't deny stuff. Uh, but you know what you could do with that is you know you could have your existing pod security policies the old style Go ahead and put the new pod security stuff in an audit mode, but in a very restricted mode and Just let it run and generate events as things are going on right and like you the kubernetes administrator can go check the audit log saying oh I see that Mo is running this privileged pod that doesn't meet the requirements now I can go talk to Mo go ahead and start getting this stuff rectified uh, but that's only possible, you know, if you run pod security in front of pod security policy. And I realize this is a obnoxious naming, right? Because pod security admission or pod security policy, like it's very hard to understand sometimes who, what you're talking about. Uh, also, uh, don't be confused by this. this. This piece of code makes it sound like pod security is enabled by default. It's not, it's feature gated. So the code is there, but feature gated off. Um, so don't, don't it, this, this whole function is kind of a pain to read because it's like, what's off? But it's on and then the intersection. So it's a, it's a little painful. Uh, oh man, it did, it did not globally change the text size. I'm sorry. Let's do, 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 let's make it bigger. Um, so I'm gonna try, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to assume that folks don't know how the internals of cube work to some degree. So one of the sort of, weird things within the Kubernetes code base is we have this concept of like an internal type or a hub type. Uh, so whenever we read your configurations or your objects, you know, we read them as like pod v1 or whatever, there's an internal representation that's completely like related, but it's meant to represent the schema across all versions. Um, so obviously today, pod security doesn't necessarily have that. But you'll, you'll kind of notice uh, some of this stuff. So like, you know, like in this, where it's doing the loading, uh, if you don't provide it anything, right, it's gonna be like, all right, I'm going to get the alpha configuration. I'm going to then default it. We'll look at what the defaults look like. Uh, then I'm gonna convert it into the internal version. It, don't get too stressed about this, but this is like all over our code base. This happens all the time. Uh, but the defaults for pod security policy are, are kind of what you would expect, which is if you don't tell us, we just assume you mean privileged. And if you don't tell us a version, we just assume latest, which by the way, privileged means don't do anything. So in order to not break all your stuff, we do nothing by default. You, you have to tell us to do something. Um, you know, it, it is what it is. When you add something new that can break stuff, you can't just turn it on, you'll break people's stuff. Uh, so looking at the actual configuration, uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? It's, um, you know, like, what version do you want to enforce at? What version do you want to audit at? And so, oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I will, I will try to remember. The sort of interesting bit here is there is a hard-coded list of exemptions. So you can imagine that you have a pod runtime class that is, I don't know, running VMs under the hood, and you're like, I don't need pod security. Like, I just have strict isolation. Uh, so you could you could tell us in this bit that like yeah if a pod asks for this I don't know Windows runtime class or something just ignore it completely like I have guaranteed out of band that this is safe. Uh, you could similarly um, have some user that's always allowed to run 
privileged pods or whatever, and you know, then you're saying I'm taking ownership of somehow gating access to these pods, right? Because if you can let, like, as a for example, if you let arbitrary people exec into a running privileged pod, well, you have broken all security for your cluster. Um, let's let's walk through. Uh, so if we go back to the um, actual code, um, I always like to jump through the name of the plugin to actually get to where it's wired in. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's like a, uh, it runs on create and update of a set of resources primarily, let me find it. So it runs against basically namespaces and pods and anything that has a pod spec. Uh, but for the most part, the enforcing side is on pods, right? So the idea would be is that you don't want to break like a deployment controller with this. You just want to prevent the pods from being run. So, because you can imagine you could have a mutating webhook that will coerce the pod into a correct shape when it's created, even if the deployment has something slightly different in it. So for the most part, it doesn't enforce on the embedded stuff. Uh, so we can, we can kind of look at how some of this code works real quick. Uh, do, 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 let's see, like the validation logic is. So, as I just mentioned, like so, there's distinct logic for how namespaces are validated, pods are validated, or pod controller. Pod controller being like controllers that cause the generation of pods because they have an embedded pod spec somewhere within the schema, like a deployment. Um, so uh, the most interesting one is like pod because that's the one that actually like does the real work, right? So it's like, all right, ignore sub resources that don't matter and so forth. Um, for doing that is to hoist errors that you get um, as early as possible because it's terrible to create a deployment and have that fail three steps later asynchronously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can see, like, you know, a pod evaluation, you know, is strictly enforced, um, and which makes sense, right? Like, at the end of the day, the pod is what we have to prevent from running, right? Like, everything else is a byproduct of all that. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, I think some of the more interesting stuff is the whole uh, registry. So with uh, the old pod security stuff, right, you had this really expressive API and you would make individual pod security objects and you would try to say like, here's my policies. That level of expression is purposely omitted from this API because the other API is unmaintainable effectively. So what we have is basically this little evaluator thing which takes a series of checks. And so the idea is that this evaluator, you know, is given the input, it runs all the checks and says, is everything okay? Uh, some of this code is like a little bit hard to read because it's trying to do like, well, you have a check at like version 1.12, but this is version 1.20. Oh, that's the, like the newest check that's available, so it must also be the 120 check. It's kind of, it's, it's a little hard to read at times. But for the most part, you don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, Jordan and Tim got it right, so you don't have to worry too much. Um, the more interesting stuff is like the actual checks themselves. So there's like this global registry of checks, and you can add to them. And the, so what, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, Lord. I can read it, so I assume you can read it. I apologize. Yep, it does. It does work on my machine. Um, so, you know, what does a check have in it? It's basically like a unique ID, what level does it run on, like baseline or restricted, and then the specific checks over time, right? So you could have a check, the same check, change its meaning over time. This is one of the core requirements of the pod security stuff, which was we can't just say like a check today is this valid over time because the pod spec changes, right? So if you, had, if you add a new field somewhere within the pod spec that's privileged, like equivalent of privileged, the existing privileged check needs to start accounting for that, but only at a newer version, right? We, we don't break you in place, right? No Kubernetes APIs just are allowed to arbitrarily break in the middle. Uh, so to show you what that looks like, uh, the privilege check is sort of the most canonical check, right? Which is like, don't let these fields be true. Uh, like false is good or undefined is good, but true is bad, right? 
And we can see that this check has existed since the beginning of time, effectively, because these fields have existed since the beginning of time. So uh, it's, you know, it's a very early check. And you can kind of see that it's like, all right, look at all the containers. And by that, I mean like all of them, like the init containers, the actual containers, the ephemeral containers, and maybe one day there'll be more containers and they'll also be in here. Um, look at all of them and make sure that nobody sets privileged equals true in there, right? And if they do, then fail with a nice error message. All right, so that one's pretty easy. Uh, and, you know, it's a pretty easy check. The run as non-root check, it's kind of long and kind of sprawling almost because it's got like, like levels of checks in it. So it kind of just keeps going for a bit. But the nice thing is that all of these things are completely distinct, right? So if the pod security standards change and we add a new check, none of the existing stuff has to change. We just add a new check to the rest of the thing. And uh, to make it so that, uh, you know, you could imagine a more expressive version of pod security that is completely implemented out of tree as a validating admission webhook. And let's say that someone wants to not run this stuff at all. They just want to run their whole thing. Well, it would be really nice for them to be able to validate that the stuff that they have built uh, conforms to the same validation checks as the internal tree stuff. And so one of the ways we do that is for each of the checks, we have a test that generates a series of passing pods and generates a series of failing pods. Right? So those checks are obviously run uh, sort of in line in our unit tests and stuff, but they also generate, so if we look at this failure case and the zeroth index, they also generate YAML matching that. So all of this YAML is available, you know, in a very structured way, right? Like this is a baseline check at version 122 and it's a failing check for the privileged uh, check, right? So if you were implementing equivalent code out of tree, you could run all of this YAML against your outer tree implementation and validate that it conforms exactly to the entry one, right? Uh, obviously, you know, this is not a strict requirement for having pod security be a thing. It's just that, it, you know, Jordan and Tim were very careful to make it so that the ecosystem could build and mature on top of this stuff. So it, it adds pretty significant complexity to our, to the work we had to do to make all this work. Uh, so I'm done with the code. Does anyone want to ask me something before I go back to the slides? Uh, I did have a question here from online, and uh, this is uh, this few sentences, so I, I promise I'm getting there a little bit longer, though. Uh, what is the recommendation for organizations that plan to use something like Gatekeeper or Caverno to provide the pod, pod security pieces? Should the built-in pod security admission controller be disabled? Or is a recommendation to have them coexist with the built-in controller providing some basic level of protection and made more fine-grained by a third-party admission controller? Um, so, um, uh, Mike, you might have a different opinion on me this, because I feel like this is an opinion and less of a, like a, like a thing that has a concrete answer. I would personally lean towards always running like the, the built-in stuff, you know, in whatever mode is, you know, obviously, if you can run everything in restricted latest, do that. Uh, that might be impractical, but, uh, and then if you have further checks, add those checks as your validating webhook or whatever you want, OPA or Caverna, whatever your favorite uh, check is. Because as you upgrade your Kubernetes cluster, this stuff will get upgraded by us. This stuff is tested by SIGAuth, this stuff is maintained by SIGAuth, right? Um, and we care deeply about this implementation and we validate this one. So I, I, would, I would sort of, uh, that's the direction I would push people. Um, but it's, it's more of an opinion. It's not a strict guideline. Mike, did you have any? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, so uh, one of the initial problems uh, with PSP that was cited when we um, you know, chose not to graduate from G, uh, to GA was that it was, uh, users were incapable of turning it on in existing clusters without uh, breaking um, their users. So uh, what we did with PSP v2, or uh, whatever you want to call it, um, was um, we designed the system such that it can be turned on and the uh, cluster will continue to behave as normal. So we would 
like we included uh, kind of what we saw as the table stakes for constraining pods, and um, you know we totally uh, accept that uh, our definitions aren't going to meet all um, use cases in the world, and I think in those cases uh, it makes sense to run um, you know OPA or Kiverno. Uh, in that case, uh, like I would say, you can use. Uh, pod security admission for as far as it gets you, and then use Kiverno. Uh, use them both at the same time. Um, really up to you. Uh, I would say probably it's not necessary to turn off uh, pod security admission controller. And if you feel like you need to, then it's probably a problem with pod security admission controller, and uh, you should let us know why. Yeah, one of the core requirements of it for it was for it to coexist with other tools that are doing similar work. Uh, and PSP made that annoyingly hard. Uh, so we've tried hard on this one not to have that. Evan? So as I understand it right now, um, if I turn on the alpha flag in 122, um, all my namespaces by default are privileged, are using privileged. Um, are there plans to either ship something so that when I create a namespace, I can set it down to a lower level or change the default in future versions of Kubernetes to steer users towards a more defended security posture? Um, so I had this discussion with uh, Jordan and Tim and David. Uh, they, they did not believe we could do that while maintaining the compatibility requirements of the Kubernetes API, which is unfortunate. Um, they, at least, like basically what they said is this this really comes down to like a choice for your distribution and what security stance it has as this default posture so you know as a for example i work for vmware in the tansu portfolio uh as soon as this thing is beta i'm gonna go turn it on and i'm gonna hit anyone with a hammer if they try to turn it off uh but uh you know that's sort of the opinion of the distribution uh at least the, the nice thing is it's very easy to go change the default. You know, it's a very simple YAML file that just says, if you have no anit uh, if you have no labels, that means you're like latest restricted or something, right? Like you can really tighten it out very easily. Uh, it is a configuration that you pass to the API server. Uh, so it's like the rest of admission. That's uh, the rest of built-in admission. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's a little unfortunate, but it's sort of, yeah, we just don't want to break people's stuff. And this, it, like, you know, if we were building Kubernetes all over again, I'm pretty sure we'd start from the beginning with this, but. Um. Yeah, that was one of the core requirements. And if, like, you are on a, uh, in an environment where you don't have access to that configuration file, it is also fairly easy to create an admission controller on namespace create and just set that default, so. All right, we have uh, one other question, and uh, we'll look to the room if anybody else has any questions too. Uh, this question is, with the built-in pod security admission implementation, is it possible for admins to add custom profiles, or are the built-in privileged, baseline, and restricted profiles the only that will be available without a third-party admission controller? Uh, yeah, so th this one I can actually give an answer, and yes, uh, baseline and restricted and privileged is all we plan to ever implement. Uh, However, the code is modular, so yes. you can go ahead, um, uh, fork it, and uh, use the same structure to uh, deploy your own admission controller um, with your own profiles. Um, yeah, I, I don't even think you have to fork it, really, you just consume it. It, it is meant to be right. a library. You don't even have to fork it. Um, so yeah, you could totally do that, but basically we're trying very hard. One, we don't want to become kingmaker. Here. We're not trying to like rule your policy in all the little ways, but just also like this is what prevented PSP from going GA is because it was an ever expanding API surface and trying to make it keep up with the growth of the pod spec over time just proved to be untenable. Um, like it, being opinionated and simplistic here is sort of allows us to even have this at all. Um, and for the people who um, are willing to uh, and have the need to go and define their own profiles, uh, 
there are a lot of very good existing solutions that would allow them to do that, um, such as OPA Gatekeeper or Kiverno. Um, so that, we felt like that was a problem that was already solved. Yeah. Yeah, at, at, at a really simple level, we want to make sure that in the future, on basically every Kubernetes distribution, sort of by default, um, create pod does not mean root on kubelet, right? Like, if we can get to that stage, like, we have made an incredible uh, set of progress into what the default is today in most environments. All right. Yeah. Come over to you. I'm glad I asked for questions. Yeah. I had a couple questions about, it. so when it was reading and trying to decide what to react on, it was looking for namespaces or things that had pod specs internally. So if you say create a deployment that violates some of the rules and it's turned on to reject it, like it'll reject the deployment creation? Or does it still allow the deployer, deployment to go through, it just rejects the pods the way like pod security policy does now? So I might be misremembering because what Mike said seemed to be mis lined with what I had in my head. I thought it was we would reject the pod, but not the deployment. We would only audit and warn on the deployment. But I might be misremembering. I think that's right. Uh, okay. So the like, uh, how is warn uh, how is warn mode triggered? Uh, so you have an annotation um, that sets like whether it's in enforced or or warn. Well, I, if I remember correctly, because it's under the pod controller path, it's always audit and warn for that piece, I think. But, but the idea was that your deployment could be out of the valid spec, but you could have a mutating admission controller for pods that coerces the pods into a valid spec. So the thing that gets created is allowed. So that was sort of the nuance that that it's not great, right? Because, no, that, like, that was my follow-up question. Is like, because there are you could mutate your pods in line, and they'll they'll they can be yeah eventually good. So rejecting the deploy outright would have been a bad idea. So. Yeah. So th that's that's the use case we're trying to maintain is that we know that the pod itself is the thing that gets run. Everything else is implementation details, right? Uh, so that's where we really enforce, and, and the namespace stuff it, where it's really powerful is um, you know server side dry run is you know, a, a really cool feature. And what you can do now is you, know, you, could, you can do a server-side dry run that says, I would like to change the label on all of my namespace to restricted latest, and just tell kubectl to do that. And what will happen is uh, you will get back uh, all the warning messages from the API server saying, hey, here's the like 17 pods across your entire cluster that do not meet this requirement. So, but you don't have to mutate anything to do that, right? So now you've gotten immediate feedback on what you need to fix without causing any disruption to your cluster. And uh, that's sort of like one of the cool things about this being label-based and just the maturity of the ecosystem now that what didn't exist when PSP was originally written. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Awesome, we have uh, time for about one more question if anybody has one. Let's uh, hop to the slides real quick and all right. Yes. Do, 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 do. Um, cool. So uh, let we can. So um, we have some. Uh, we're always looking for people to join uh, Sig Auth and get involved in the community. So uh, a couple good links for new contributors to check out. Uh, these slides will be. Uh, posted next to our talk in the schedule. Um, so come check it out. We have some good first issues. Um, we have a Slack channel, and we uh, meet every uh, two weeks on uh, Wednesday um, at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we'll have a lot of good conversations, a lot of uh, ongoing initiatives discussed there. Um, and we welcome any, everyone, anyone and everyone to get involved. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for attending today, and I uh, hope you had a good keep going. As a reminder, this stuff, uh, the PSP stuff is alpha, so if there's something wrong, <laughs> please come tell yeah, us, because we can fix it before we promote it to yeah. beta, because it gets a whole lot harder, because this is Kubernetes, and we don't try to break people's stuff, and everyone likes to depend on every implementation detail of everything we build. <laughs> so, but thank you all. Thanks, everyone.